Yes, a very warm welcome to our Conrad Adenauer Foundation podcast, Bridging Voices. My name is Dennis Schrei. I'm the head of the program of the Multinational Development Policy Program here in Brussels. I'm very happy today to have two distinguished guests with us. On my right, it's uh, Mr. Mark Frings. He is the Secretary General of the Committee of German Catholics. And um, on my left, Mrs. Karin Jansikova, the Program Manager for Climate energy and global environmental governance uh, here from my office and today we would like to discuss um, on COP27 on the outcomes but also on uh, the role of Mark, your organization um, in climate change and also on your views on climate change. So Mark, maybe you can introduce yourself to our audience and also Karin, you can say a few things about yourself before we start uh, discussing the issue. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Thank you for having me. Since three years, I'm the Secretary General of the Central Committee of German Catholics. It's quite a unique organization as we bring together as a Catholic umbrella organization, lays voices in the German context, different associations, um, relief organizations, people and representatives from the dioceses come together on several occasions to discuss not only matters that concern the church, but also that concerns politics, as we are strongly con uh, convinced that we as Catholics also through our faith can contribute to political debates, to social debates and to challenges ahead of us. And this um, brings us to a very long history. We started our work in the mid-19th century. So we made our contributions within the framing of the uh, German Revolution, but also in different other occasions. Currently, as, as everybody might be aware of, the Catholic Church in Germany is, a, is in a huge crisis. But it does not stop us from taking also political positions. And uh, we take these positions with regard to social uh, issues, economic issues, but the international dimension is also very relevant as the Catholic Church take a, takes a very holistic approach. And this is why climate change, uh, sustainability are uh, of um, great concern and great relevance for us. And this brings me also now to Brussels, where we have regular talks with MPs, with decision makers, with representatives of the European Commission in order to bridge also our positions with the global context. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark. And I would like to ask Karin to introduce yourself as well. Yes, so quickly, just listening about uh, Catholic Church, uh, just to mention that my working career started back in 20, 2004, uh, working for Ecumenical Council of Churches in Czech Republic. But then my pathway was through public, private sector ministries, and now I ended up um, at CAS, and that's maybe why I am promoting so much the multi-stakeholder approach, and bridging, uh, being the bridge between Global South and Global North, and tackling the, the hot issues of days, which is climate change and energy security, uh, energy transition, just some transition as such that no one is forgotten. So this is our approach, uh, what we actually do here at the office, but maybe Dennis can, can talk about it a bit more. But really happy to, to get in dialogue with you today, and let's see what our dialogue will bring at the end. Thanks a lot, Karin, and I think we can also go directly into the issue. You mentioned that you address um, issues of societal concern, but also environmental issues of key importance to your organization. We are at the midst of COP27 now, and uh, I uh, read that you have published a few statements uh, on climate, on the connection of climate and poverty, but also on the impact of climate change uh, on the global south. Why are these key issues for your organizations? Yeah, first of all, I think I should mention that uh, some of our members, all of our members within the Central Committee are doing this voluntarily, are currently in Chamel Chech, uh, accompanying the process, lobbying for their positions, because also international organizations um, are part of, of our structure. Yeah. It is important because we take a, a very global, a very sustainable uh, perspective on things. And um, I think it's quite good that uh, we currently receive a lot of support also through Pope Francis, although we also make very clear that we as, as lay people take an independent position. But uh, given that um, Pope Francis, since he was elected in, 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 in 2013, um, always also focused on ecolo ecological questions, on questions of sustainability with his two documents, his, his two encyclicals, uh, Laudato Si and, and Fratelli Tutti, where he takes a very 
comprehensive understanding of peace, a peace that is not only the absence of war, but also that takes into consideration social welfare, um, um, a social ecological balance. And this gives us a lot of hope. And um, this is also translated through some of our member associations. Among others are Miserio, Adveniat, so organizations that are working worldwide who have direct access to the vulnerable groups and, and societies that already today, uh, and not only since today, suffer from climate change consequences. And this brings us also in the role as an advocate to lobby for those um, people that might not have a voice in German politics, in politics in general when it comes to the global north, um, so that we can build bridges here, not only as Catholics, but also as, um, as, organiz as an organization that has direct access to decision makers. And this uh, makes it very important. I mean, given our Christian belief, of course, that, um, that the whole globe needs a better future, that we think uh, also in terms of the next generation. Uh, I mean, still, we have uh, strong young voices also in our structures that make this a very uh, pivotal point, um, saying that uh, older generations did not do enough to protect the climate, to protect our Earth. Um, and I think this is, I mean, this is a wide variety of, of pillars that uh, give us enough support to, to work on these um, issues uh, more concretely. Thank you very much. Uh, you also referred to Lauda to see, um, praise be to you, um, which is the second uh, answer encyclical of Pope Francis, um, and it has the subtitle on care for our common home. And um, uh, in this, uh, in one of the chapters, he criticizes quite a bit consumerism, irresponsible development, um, environmental degradation, uh, global warming, and he calls also for people to change behaviors uh, and to unite for global action. Would you subscribe uh, to such a st strong statement? I think in general, it's, it, these, these prerequisites that he brings together here as a design is something that we, that we totally can subscribe to. Um, because I think also in Germany, uh, with very strong groups now advocating for, for more concrete and, and more ambitious uh, climate um, policy, it is crystal clear that we have to introduce more traumatic changes when we want to reach and, and, uh, and, and fulfill the 1.5 degree target. Then I think what we are doing con concretely today is not, is not enough. Um, we have a legal framing, and I think we will discuss this later more concretely. We have a financial responsibility, um, and it's a responsibility um, that has a national and a global dimension. When we talk about the vulnerable people, We also have to, to check uh, about the situation within Europe. I mean, we also have low-income groups here in Germany, in Europe, that need to be protected, that need to be considered when we do concrete policies, especially currently in a perfect storm situation where so many crises show up at the same time. Um, but this does not replace the global responsibility, especially as an actor as Germany, and, and you've mentioned multilateralism, which is in the core of our international understanding. We are part of this one world, uh, not only in, as Christians, but also I think as, as Germany here, I think we share many values um, as, as church representatives, but also as, as, um, as the German government is currently framing its, its climate approach. Um, and uh, for that, I think the, the, the general assumption, yes, is right. When it comes to the to the consequences, we also have to see that um, we can in Europe or in Germany more concretely do a lot because of a certain welfare standard. This needs also to be um, protected in a way. Uh, I think not through closed borders, but also in focusing on current needs of the German economy, for instance. There is a great crisis status currently. Um, the German economy is based um, mainly on, on uh, small, medium-sized enterprises that are now currently struggling with the situation in which they are now investigating into the idea of, of moving their companies to other countries. And this makes it, of course, then also difficult for us to make this contribution that needs to be definitely um, sized um, economically, financially, politically. Um, and I think here comes a certain dilemma situation where Pope Francis definitely makes the right point, criticizing current consumers' interests who might not have always the feeling that they are in charge, that they can do the that they can make this difference that is needed. And this then needs also, I think, to be translated into the national level, into the level of decision makers. 
Thanks a lot, Mark. If we look at achieving the 1.5 grad Celsius objective, we all aware that at the moment, as you said, we are not on track. Do you think that um, technological innovation um, companies, um, the business sector can solve the problem? Or are you also critical? Or do you see also the need for personal investment, for trying to consume less, trying to have a more sustainable lifestyle? So um, what is your specific objective or specific idea on this? I think in general we should um, enable people and enable actors in this regard and should not create new borders or create um, artificial enemy structures. I think everybody has a certain responsibility and every individual, be it a person or be it a company, uh, needs to check where he, she can do more, can do better. Um, yes, individual consumerism needs to be um, definitely be more in the focus. I think a lot has changed throughout the past years. Uh, when, I, when I think about um, supply chains, I think there's today much more awareness that um, textile industries um, should also follow certain standards, standards that are in the core of our values when it comes to human rights. Uh, we are discussing in these days a lot uh, the, um, the um, soccer um, World Cup in, in Qatar, but I think also our individual um, interests, uh, be it in the textile industry, as to take one concrete example, is, is something that in, in recent years I think has uh, raised much more awareness than, than before. When it comes to technical innovation, I would, I would argue the same way. I think, I mean, especially a country like Germany that has little to no natural resources, very much depends on innovation. Without innovation, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so I would take a quite a positive um, uh, stand in this regard, saying that yes, we need more of this kind of innovation. Of course, in the framing of a of a value oriented setting, um, but I think only this will also enable us to make our also technical contribution uh, to a climate and environment protection. Thanks a lot. And you, you also mentioned that currently we observe that the climate change agenda um, is a little bit. Uh, overshadowed by also the war in Ukraine. We see that a lot of attention, of course, is politically put on, on, the, on this crisis, which is, of course, also connected to the energy crisis and is connected to um, increasing energy prices that we, we are facing. So um, energy autonomy and trying to be more energy efficient are core pillars of future decarbonization pathways of countries. Um, you are now here in Brussels and uh, How do you see, or what can you can you do as an organization to to discuss um, also with political leaders um, the question of um, sustainable decarbonization as a key prerequisite to prevent, of course, f uh, future conflicts about energy, future conflicts about raw material? Because um, at the end, it's about um, how to be efficient, how to have safe energy, but also. Um, how to be less dependent on others, uh, how to be less uh, fragile as a state. Um, could you please elaborate a little bit on, on this? I think there are several um, dimensions that need to be taken into consideration in this regard. Uh, on, on a national level, we see that within less than a year, the coalition agreement that was signed in, in Germany and in, in the current government is already outdated because of the situation that you've, ju that you've just described. Uh, after the, the, the one issue crisis, Corona, we now have a, have a war. And while a Corona enabled us to understand that Germany has a huge homework in front of it, due to digitalization that simply did not take place in Germany as, as fast enough. We now see with regard to the, to the terrible war in Ukraine that um, energy dependency was not uh, in the focus of, of recent government years uh, because it was simply not perceived as relevant enough. Um, so my first dimension here would be that we, um, that we take previous decisions quite seriously and that we can even refer to the to the to last last um, uh, COP in Glasgow, where we had a clear decision taken by state leaders saying that no further fossil projects um, should be made or signed. Uh, we know where we are today. The other, it's, it's completely the, uh, the the other side that we are now seeing 180 degree turnover um, in this regard. So. Um, 
when we when we focus on this dimension, I would I would say let's uh, also promote the idea of multilateralism and the idea of cooperation and also making viable decisions that are then also taken granted and and executed execute, executed. Um, then there comes the Christian dimension in here, and here again I would promote the idea of a of a one world concept, um, and I would say that. I mean, everything that's been done needs to be done through the lens of the vulnerable groups. And if one euro is invested in a way that it helps people who suffer already today under climate crisis consequences, then it's a good, it's a good investment. And this is something that also decision makers in Sharm el Sheikh and other way, also in, in Bali, where the G20 just recently um, met, should always take it to, into um, uh, consideration. So maybe these are the the two most important ones. And then it comes to, 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 I think, very concrete issues where we think, I think, more broadly, if it's about a carbon reduction worldwide or even within the EU, uh, we don't give up in, in supporting the idea of the Fit for 55 package within the European context. Um, maybe here we can also ask for for ambitious steps uh, that, that deepen the, the different packages that now need to be implemented or even executed. Um, we have to, to think about, again, we discussed it before, the different um, policy areas. Uh, I would like to bring in here also traffic and, and housing. Maybe we discussed this later as well, because here we also see that the whole infrastructural turn is simply not happening. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are coming with very concrete short-term strategies, but it does not help us really building a more sustainable future that really helps on the long reducing um, uh, CO2 emissions. Yes, and you, you also mentioned that we have on, on the one side now, now the war, but we also have expectations from the Global South, and we should not underestimate that it seems that uh, we can also observe this in the current negotiations in COP27, that the expectations from countries in the Global South is very high when it comes to technological transfer, to financing green transformation, to finance investment, and uh, the pledges the Global North is currently giving doesn't seem to be enough. Uh, also, when we discuss loss and damages, as you know, the expectations are huge and seem not to be covered by the Global North. So is there, in your opinion, a real commitment by the Global North or are they just also drawn by uh, all these different crises they are currently facing themselves that they cannot make the commitment which would be needed to basically have a real global approach on the issue? Hmm. The simple answer is no, there is not. Uh, I don't see the, the, the signs uh, focusing on this. Um, also, I mean, expressing the concern that others see, I mean, especially the younger generations. I mean, we have now a generation taking over, not only taking over parliaments, but also the streets, expressing their concern, doing this very radically. And it's really hard to criticize them because we have to consider and acknowledge that other generations completely failed. And when scientists tell us that um, the global north must spend five to ten times more money than they are doing today in order to find to fight the, the current climate uh, crisis, then we obviously see, uh, and this was your question, that that the global north is not doing enough. And I think, and I think. Like, I mean, again, yeah, we have many different topics down the table, and, and one dimension is also the post-colonial debate. I mean, there is a very relevant point here that the Global South comes now with demands, but at the same time, also here I would not now dig into, into new frontiers, there's also high potential, um, because the Global South has a lot to offer in this regard. I mean, if, when we talk about uh, rainforest protection, uh, when, when we talk um, about water scarcity, about forced migration, I mean, there are so many dimensions that need to be addressed Uh, through direct negotiations. And I think that the global framing here needs to be readdressed. Maybe the current formats are not sufficient anymore. Uh, we've made our experiences. Loss and damage is, is, uh, um, is a term that is discussed for the past 40 years, 30 years at least. Um, 
and and we clearly see that the the legal responsibility besides the financial uh, responsibility is simply not taken because governments are afraid that once they also step into legal responsibilities they might be blamed for everything and this makes them even more reluctant and this is something that we clearly does not want to, do not want to see i have one point to add uh, you mentioned climate change is really complex challenge I fully agree. It's very complex, and you already touched upon many topics today, just in a couple of minutes. You know, technology, innovation, uh, social justice. Uh, we call it now climate justice mainly. Uh, decision making. You know, role of uh, governments, role of youth. Everybody, everyone wanna have a voice. Everyone, of course, wanna see that, uh, and there is some impact of the action. All c call for climate action. But at the end, um, we still feel that it's not accelerated enough to make a real impact in a very short term time because the uh, clock is ticking and the planet, is, planet environment is changing. And I, I feel like we are always putting a human being in the center of our discussions. And I think sometimes we should change the perspective and look at our planet. planet. And as Dennis mentioned and Pope mentioned, uh, this is our home. And we should not forget, because we consider our home as the four walls, we live each and every day, you know, with our families. But the world around is changing, and we still like demand the same consumption, the same electricity amount. But the, I feel that the policymakers are mainly, you know, responding to their voters to simply satisfy their needs and um, making quite unsystemic, not sustainable solutions or, de or decisions. But I think, of course, we need to find short-term solutions, but also look long-term. And we speak about climate change as a challenge, but I see it as an opportunity. Opportunity to rethink our ways of behavior, as you mentioned. And I think it always become, you know, comes back to us as uh, individuals. And, but also how, how we have an impact in our small environment, in our small bubble, in our ecosystem we live. But really also when... For example, within our projects, uh, we focus now on biodiversity loss. And when we see the, the enthusiasm of young uh, people and youth who are traveling around the world and capturing, uh, collecting data about what's going on uh, with biodiversity loss, how many you know, species are lost annually because of human interventions as well. It's, it's not the only one, but humans play a huge role in, in this. So as I said, we should also sometimes put in the center our planet, and nature, and our environment we live in and try to reconnect. So um, I think it's not just about innovation technology, but about understanding uh, the impact of our acting. And also uh, I feel that, and this is my question towards you, um, I have impression that the policymakers mainly focus on mitigation measures, but the adaptation is still a bit lacking because to adapt to what will come and to prevent uh, also what, you know, the, the disaster which will come, it's quite key. And uh, having discussions and dialogue with Global South uh, policymakers, but experts as well, they always say, you know, <laughs> it's, it's uh, always a disaster which mobilizes people to act and change things. But do we need to wait for disaster? Or is it then a challenge owner, a charismatic politician, who finally, you know, takes it as his own challenge and goes for it and make a system, systemic transformation and change. But not, it's not always the case. So we should avoid disaster. We don't need to count, we cannot count that every time there is a charismatic leader, but more we should, again, focus on long-term strategic approach and create policies and, you know, which will support sustainable development and really plan from scratch scenarios, as Dennis mentioned, bring some case studies in close collaboration with different stakeholders. That's why, <laughs> again, promoting multi-stakeholder approach in this kind of crisis and emergency moments, where if you want to really build something sustainable, you can make it disconnected, because in nature everything is connected. and We are part of the nature, we are not above the nature. And I think this is also sometimes misread from also especially Christian uh, world, that the human is actually the one, you know, who is governing and uh, overlooking around all the species about what's around us. 
And me also studying a theology and philosophy a long time ago, I always came to this point when they said, yeah, okay, it's not the human who is in the center. Um, you should not forget it. We are just, you know, one world. Um, yeah, so this is, I just wanted to reflect on what you said. Maybe it's a slightly disagreement, um, given that we currently have in Rome um, a pope who's named after a saint who had a very close relationship with nature and, and animals. I think this is also kind of a role model. I definitely would say that, that human mankind should not be above, but should be in partnership with the entire environment, with the global context. But I subscribe to everything that you've just said, especially when it comes to biodiversity. We didn't tackle this so far, but we've never had in such a short period as in recent years, lost so many species worldwide in, in, in human mankind history. I mean, it's horrible. Yeah? I mean, g given that this has a huge impact on the ecosystem, not only, I mean, we can start with the bees in Germany and, and continue with, with the rainforest in the global south and see what kind of damage was already produced. I think it's kind of a um, cognitive dissonance that we are observing because the perfect storm is already here. The crisis is there and it's not far away from us. Yeah, I come from a region, very western part of Germany, where uh, a tiny little river, the Ahr, last year provoked a horrible flooding scenario. More than 100 people have died in this uh, scenario. Out of nothing, this, this, this showed up and... To be very honest, I mean, I'm coming from, from, from this area that was just th there a day before it happened. Um, it's not very much on the agenda currently in Germany. And, and maybe, I mean, we shouldn't be too broadly discussing things here, but uh, maybe it has to do with the current crisis modus in general that the public mainly focuses on fo one, two issues, and that's it. It's, it's, it's limited and it, it, it's boxed and... Um, there are still too many factors that make us ignoring the reality. And I'm, I'm not so sure you've mentioned if, if adaptation and mitigation are still the right concepts. I mean, maybe it's already over. I mean, maybe if we've had a, a chance in the last century to work through adaptation and mitigation. But now I think we even have to talk about the term of ambitious climate policy. I mean, what is ambitious if we already know that the 1.5 um, degree target is, is no longer doable? If, if we are end up with 2.7, I mean, the consequences are all on the table, um, but the willingness to, to react um, is, um, is still not present, is not given. Um, another issue, because uh, also this is something where we already see the consequences on a political level, Germany since uh, 2015 has hosted many many refugees first from syria and afghanistan and now from ukraine There's, there was much solidarity also much hate but much more solidarity and much more love um, and now scientists are telling us that by by 2050 three billion people will live in hot spots of climate crisis and they will not stay there they will move And we don't know to which direction they will move. So I think we have reached a point where, where climate change has, has uh, reached a point or a matter of national interest, maybe of national security interest. And uh, wh when I came here, I, I reread um, uh, uh, President von der Leyen's mission statement when she first was, was uh, elected uh, here in the European Parliament. And I found it quite interesting that, I mean, for her it was a point in the beginning, focusing on the Green Deal, focusing on, on climate protection and, and, and climate crisis. And uh, the, 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 her framing was very much focusing on democracy, on the rule of law, on gender equality. And I thought when I, when I now, after like almost three years, reread this text, I thought, yeah, we have maybe, I mean, it's a very normative objective, but maybe we have also uh, find a situation in which climate protection and, and the climate crisis fight is considered to be as relevant as the promotion of democracy, of the rule of law, of, of values that are currently very much under, under attack. I mean, look how, how much populism is rising in, in Europe, in the United States, in other parts. Uh, we, we all crossed our fingers with regard to Brazil very recently. So many countries turn into the wrong direction. Um, and at the same time, these actors also question, I mean, scientific proofs with regard to, to climate change. And this, I think, it's even more be fostered, I think. Um, just to add what you said, I mean, just to clarify, I didn't 
mean that Catholic Church or Christians are putting a human being into the center of everything. It's more how it is being perceived by a secularized society. And when I, uh, as it worked for Ecumenical Council of Churches, we opened a dialogue with really atheistic uh, part of, for example, Czech society, even with uh, members of Communist Party or other parties, and we discussed actually what 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 are our common values, if there are still any, even if you have like belief, non-belief, and so on. And as said, they were very strongly uh, reacting to to Catholic Church, saying that um, we are too egocentric, and that important is like the so-called collaboration with the others. But it was funny to hear it from, uh, for example, the Communistic Party, where they had in center especially human and industrialization. And uh, as you know about the persecution of, of priests in the times, so I'm just wondering, um, do you think that the Catholic Church and, and the wise and beautiful words of uh, the Pope are uh, heard enough? Are they... Because I think I, I still lacking talking about innovation, transformation, you know, and scaling up and startups and how we can all problem solve with clean energy. I could underline it. I'm very much supporting projects and workshops which are uh, which are about clean energy and clean tech because I think it's really needed. But at the same time, I'm still a bit lacking some, you know, discussions about uh, the situation and uh, the human behavior, as you said, and what are our common values, what we should protect, not just the nature, but also some uh, talking about climate justice. You know, my question is, can this be the climate justice, so like a field where the Catholic Church could have a bit stronger voice to talk about because as we know the Europe uh, is based on, on a long Christian tradition and values and I think as EU is the one kind of uh, still protecting the human rights and is always welcome and there is something wrong uh, seeing it at Russia-Ukraine conflict, I think this is something where the church could really have a voice and clearly uh, articulate the position. So just my question was you think about Maybe uh, on, on, on two levels, I would like to, to provide an, an answer. First of all, on a, on a value level, I would say yes, equality and justice are in the core um, of our also political thinking. What I'm observing when I, when I bring our understanding um, of these values together with public debates, I would say our contribution could also make to close a certain gap between the understanding of justice, which is, I think, not only a Christian understanding, but also a broad understanding, and the law. I mean, the, I think that we also, given the current debates that we are seeing on, on climate crisis, we clearly see that a new generation has a different understanding of what justice should be. And I think the law should provide the platform that justice will be promoted and protected. So I think this is a contribution that, that the church can make. But you asked me more concretely, and I want to hide from this question, if, if the, the Pope or if, if churches are heard enough. And I would say from a German, uh, now mainly secular point of view, no. Um, and I bring in the, the, the very German perspective here. 2022 is the first year in German history where the majority of people living in our country do not belong to either of the two big churches, be it, be it Catholic, be it Protestant. And I think what we need is a more humble appearance because, uh, and I've mentioned in the beginning, we do a lot of political advocacy work. So I enter the parliament on a, on a weekly, almost daily basis. I go to ministries, to ministers, state ministers, yeah. And I see and I experience that I have to explain who we are. We are no longer considered to be a well-known actor, which is a big contradiction given that still 20 million Germans are Catholic. But the idea that, that Catholics also take political positions is no longer that much on the table that uh, politicians uh, welcome me and openly want to discuss with me social, economic, 
or other topics, they are rather surprised that I do not want to discuss with them the sexual abuse scandal that of course needs a lot of attention because it's not over, but this is not a topic here for a year, although I could also talk uh, about this for hours. But it shows me that I think also the church needs to adjust its strategy to promote these uh, positions because especially when it comes to sustainability, when it comes also to ethical questions in general, the church has um, has a very con very very important contribution to make, and this brings me back to what you said when you introduced yourself. You talked and promoted the idea of of of, uh, of a multilateral, multi. Give me the right term. How did you multi call stakeholder it? Multi stakeholder. Multi because the stakeholder issue. This is the important one because I think that the church. I mean, if uh, if I am in the humble position to to recommend something to, to to church representatives, the position that the church should take today is also to not only communicate with the church with with the state, but also to other NGOs and to connect better with the civil society. I mean, we are as the Central Committee a very strong voice of the German Catholic civil society. But I also make what I've just described as an experience when I when I do networking within the secular civil society environment. And I think given that we have this global network, I mean, Catholics always think global. I mean, we are one church globally. Yeah? This is one of the beauty of our, relig of our, of our confession. And, um, and with this regard, I think it's, it's very important always to build these bridges in, in different directions and not to take these bridges for granted because they are no longer there. We've missed the chance maybe in the last years to follow the secular trend. Uh, our office of the Central Committee is in Berlin. The vast majority does not and has never belonged to any church. Uh, and at the same time, it's one of the biggest Catholic uh, cities in Germany due to the the huge size of, of, uh, of the city. And this also reminds me on a very daily basis that you have to make clear where you're coming from, why you're doing this, and why you still uh, I mean, deserve to be a good partner for, for relevant future questions. Next question, Mark. Uh, at the heart of the European Green Deal strategy is that no one is being left behind. What do you understand under such slogan? Yeah, what comes to my mind is uh, Vice President uh, Timmerman, who at one point said, uh, "Well, if the um, if the social or the the ecological transition is not just, then there will be no transition." So I think it's it is very important to take a very a holistic approach to think about the marginalized society, so social groups, not only within Europe but also. Um, globally, and I mean, coming from Germany, we are very convinced of, of subsidiarity to think about different political layers where decisions, uh, first of all, need to be taken, but also translated and, and explained. Uh, and this is something where also we as a church, I think, can can do a great contribution. We work as an umbrella organization, so we take a very elite perspective, let's say, because we address uh, Catholic national interests into into the political arena in, in Germany, but through our structure, we have direct access to each and every parish in Germany. Uh, and I think this is this is also the beauty of, of the Catholic Church, that we as a partner can contribute to better translation and to better maybe also conversation between politics and, and individuals on the needs to to embark on such a um, broader transition. And in the end, yes, everybody has to understand that he, she is also addressed as an object and an, and an subject because this person is in the end also asked to change individually. Um, so I think this is this is one dimension when it comes to the, let's say, the EU family. But when we take the global perspective, I think it's also obvious that um, also here nobody should be left behind because so many have been left behind already. Um, and, um, and I think here again, we have to think about the marginalized groups, the vulnerable ones, those who are already affected. Um, they need, I think, stronger also, I think, lobby groups being present uh, in these regions in the global north where decisions are taken to make sure that the, the need for action and the urgency for action is much more visible. Um, you speak about vulnerable people. This vulnerability in relation to climate change, and we spoke already about different disasters happening almost on a daily basis around the globe. Um, I understand that the church always put in front vulnerable people 
the last will be the first and the first will be the last, as uh, Jesus teaches. But uh, my question is, again, going back to the European Green Deal, do you see any external dimension? What the Global South could read in the European Green Deal? Are there any parts, I know if you are familiar with the strategy, but are there any parts which you would specifically underline to pay attention uh, from the Global South to, towards the European Union Green Deal. Is it this part? Is it the heart of the European Green Deal? Because from our practice, we see sometimes they say, your 455 is a nice inspiration, but it cannot apply to our ecosystem, to our environment, to our political situation, to our situation in our country. If we take, for example, Uganda in South Africa, we cannot come as the EU and say, hey, please implement this uh, net zero pathway because they say, hey, we haven't had rain already for three months, and we don't know what to plan. So for us, is first secure the food for our children and our family, and then talk about big uh, challenging climate policies and strategies. So from this perspective, do you think that is there any, like, as again, common value we should focus on as the global, <laughs> as the human beings living on this earth, which we should really have at heart? Is this no one being left behind? considering what you what you defined as no one being left behind. Is it the core we should not forget while going through green transformation and reacting to climate change challenge? Mm, I might be not aware of every detail, but, but my reading of the documents that are on the table so far, um, for me, rather reflect a domestic homework package where it's about uh, considering and defining responsibilities that the EU can take within the group of, of EU member states and to lesser extent uh, looks towards towards the south because it's first of all the, the guiding question how can we reduce 55% um, of emissions um, to 2030 like within a lesser decade this is this might be an ambitious goal others would say 55 is already not enough but 65 should be maybe uh, should be maybe the target um, uh, but I think it does not weak the, the current strategy of the EU, as we can see or as we've seen in, in Sharm el Sheikh, the Europeans take a very I mean, supportive uh, approach towards the Global South. A new tool that's been discussed uh, includes the Global Shield, um, which might be questioned, but at least it's an offer, um, considering or framing it as an insurance tool for those who are affected, so to provide them with, with easy access to, to financial support and in order to adjust. But um, again, and you've, you've asked that earlier, I think money is not the, the only tool that will help us. I think it's about a general attitude and I think here the EU can definitely do more and better. Yes, I think we are coming close uh, to the end of this podcast, but maybe just to mention that a lot of countries in the Global South um, expect a lot from the EU, but the EU has to be also humble because the challenges uh, are so huge that, of course, the EU, al EU alone can cannot be responsabilized for the whole um, challenges which are related to green transition. Um, and as you, of course, know, a lot of developing countries or middle-income countries um, still are on a development path. So they still have to overcome poverty, they have to overcome um, basic needs for their societies. And uh, of course, they have to make the cost-benefit analysis. How can we overcome it while transforming in a green way? And um, these are the main challenges now, because challenges in the global south are multi multi-challenges, so to say, um, that we do not face here. And I think we always have to be aware of that, um, not to make the mistake that trying to promote templates or trying to promote policies to be adapted in different countries which have completely different challenges. So we should be humble, but on the same time share experiences uh, on specific technologies or on, 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 on lessons learned on from our green transformation. Um, although, of course, we are also not a role model. So I think that's also very important to keep in mind that um, the EU has very different countries with very different success or non-success success stories. So um, this is just to add that we all need to be very humble in our efforts to cooperate and to, to offer partnerships from which the EU also can learn. 
as we see, for example, a lot of countries like Iraq or who live, who live or who are situated in dry areas, they have much more um, experience with adaptation because of water shortage. So I think we can also learn a lot from countries in the global south on adaptation, on green transformation. Um, so this is always, I think, um, a lesson learned from both sides, which, which we should be aware of. If, if I may, I would like to comment this. You, you speak about multi-challenging. I would add it, there's also an interconnectivity, mm -hmm. also of good opportunities, as you've just mentioned it in the end. Um, I, I remember for several years I've, I've lived in Indonesia. And Indonesia, I mean, takes a very important role currently also in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, also a member of the G20. I think it's a perfect example on... Um, on how this partnership could look like, because Indonesia is one of these emerging countries, a former tiger state, uh, became like 20 years ago a member of this very influential group of, of 20. Um, Indonesia, together with, with only two, three other countries, um, is responsible for the majority of rainforest worldwide. And there is also an economic dimension here that this rainforest is protected and not transformed into palm oil industries, uh, as I've seen it on, on Sumatra dramatically. I mean, everybody who has lived in, in Singapore knows about the hazard coming either from Malaysia's uh, oil, uh, palm, uh, palm oil um, plantations or from, from the Indonesian side. So it's, it's a horrible situation. Flooding is a, is a daily experience. If you if you live in Jakarta, the first thing, if you look for housing, is how, how horrible is the flooding here? Because it's, it's I mean, present everywhere. They will move their capital in the, in the upcoming uh, decade. Um, but, I mean, providing them also with economic incentives show how, I mean, also from a creative point of view, climate cooperation can look like. You've mentioned Iraq. I mean, the Middle East is one of the regions that suffers most of, of water scarcity. Um, and countries there really do not like to cooperate, as, as we currently see, I mean, in different parts, in the Mashrek as well as in, in, in the Maghreb uh, region. But uh, energy security, food security, um, water scarcity, are, I mean, common objectives, common threats for these for these nations, and it I think also provides from time to time create cooperation opportunities even between states that formally do not want to talk to each other, um, and I think this is something that we take or should take more into consideration to see that there is south south dialogue taking place, but that there are also incentives. I mean, take. The European history, yeah, if you come from a coal and steel community uh, history, this is, I mean, maybe not a role model, but something that could also work in other regions in the world in order to provide them with a concrete tool to find cooperation. And then we have maybe on, the, on a second level the positive benefit that it also helps saving the environment. Just a small example from my life. Um, as you mentioned, also your experience, I experience my kids and daily life and I see how important it is to provide them with tools um, to understand how to be um, independent and understand as said, the connections between uh, different layers. So we go to the woods and we look how to ensure that I can eat, you know, if there is something happening. Sorry, I'm from Czech Republic, so we are used to, to look at the survival <laughs> uh, momentums, especially in early childhood, so uh, still under the other system. We had like special training about how to survive in uh, in such uh, extreme situations, and it uh, you know provide me with tools to understand what I can do, how I can adapt to really quickly changing environment. And I think here I would underline the role of education uh, that really we should maybe also reform the education system and reflecting the changes because because the education in some countries are still just really, um, how to say, not reflecting, not creative enough. So I, I think this should be also focused how we prepare the next generations for the changing situation environment and really provide them with tools that they understand how to react and as said, not continue it all waves, which won't work in the future. So this is just to bring my uh, concrete example. And also I would like to ask you at the end about some good practice or do you have any any, do you see any light in the tunnel in a way of how 
humans are already now reacting to the climate change, some success stories, something where you see, yeah, this this was taken as an opportunity and something is changing. You mentioned Indonesia and maybe they are now also more focused on adaptation measures. But um, as you travel a lot, can you bring us some positive examples how people or communities are reacting and having success with what they did? Hmm. I mean, on, on a very personal level, I can just subscribe to, to what you've just described. I see the next generation coming up um, uh, who are already much more aware, much more educated. They teach us already now uh, how to deal with the situation, how to, how to do better. I mean, this is something that I that I see on a personal level uh, on a daily basis. Mm, um, a beautiful experience that I've that I've made was, in fact, in the Middle East, and this is why I came up with this uh, example. Uh, I I um, worked together with um, different partners from from Israel, Palestine, and Jordan uh, in a different political and and and, and professional context, and these um, these initiatives found a common ground where they where they seen a common threat which is water scarcity and energy supply and they developed the idea that um, there could be a positive interconnectivity um, desalinated water from the Mediterranean coast in exchange for renewables could be possible even without peace agreements and I think this is something where creativity can lead us to a better future. And I think we need to see more. We need to see more champions coming up with something proactively. Um, and I think this then in the end also leads to multitasking, uh, a multi-stakeholder perspective, um, because it's not only the state who has to come with the initiative. The civil society brings together a lot of knowledge and experience. The business sector can do so as well. And all of this, I think, should work hand in hand and not form different bubbles that are not connected enough. I think with this positive end, Mark, um, we will end the broadcast. Thank you very much for your time today. It was a great pleasure to discuss a multitude of, of issues. And uh, we are hopefully having you again in the near future. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Karen.